be it political participation, be it segregated Muslim communities, be it issues related to Muslim women, or even sex abuse committed by some Muslim men. There is no stopping of headlines in the media related to Muslims. In a democratic society, media plays a vital role in defending public interests by mediating between society and state. Such role allows the media privileged access to the minds of the public. The end of the Cold War in 1990s saw the media attention towards religion significantly increased, particularly after the tragic events of 9-11 and 7-7. Stuart Hoover, a pioneering scholar of religion in the media, thinks that the reason behind the increased interaction between religion and media is that in this modern age, we are continuously exposed to and are largely dependent on media for information. The question arises, how competent are the media in depicting religions? Hoover argues that journalists lack the knowledge and expertise to report the religious dimension of news stories adequately. Badenbaum suggests two reasons why the reporting of religious aspects of news stories is often woefully inadequate. First, the predominant ethos of the newsroom is secular, and many journalists have an antipathy towards religion. Secondly, news stories are primarily characterized by controversy and conflict, and that this, and, and that this consequently misrepresents the reality of religion as most people experience it. Bianarski finds poor representation and interpretation of religion in the media where it is either ignored or sensationalized, and either of those extremes distorts its reality. Most people in the West have little knowledge about, of Islam or the cultural practices of Muslims and are largely dependent on the media. Unfortunately, research on media representations of Muslims overwhelmingly show that a large section of the British media fails to portray Muslims in a fair manner. But why do some sections of the media portray Muslims so negatively? Elizabeth Poole, one of our esteemed speakers today, concluded that the British media portray Islam and Muslims from an ideological standpoint, considering them as a threat to Western interests. While observing the Islam versus West attitude in the British media, she said, the creation of a dichotomy between Islam and the West is a consequence of this, presented in the press along a series of binary opposition in which the West stands for rational, humane, developed and superior, and Islam for aberrant, underdeveloped and inferior. British Muslims are now positioned as a threat to security and incompatible to mainstream British way of life by a section of the British news media. While analyzing 974 newspaper articles about British Muslims between 2000 and 2008, a Cardiff University study observed that 80% discourses, particularly in the tabloids, associate Islam and Muslims with threats, problems, or in opposition to dominant British values. Baker et al. made a comprehensive linguistic analysis of British newspapers' coverage of Islam and Muslims between 2000 and 2009, and found the media's attitude towards Muslims as counterproductive. They found some explicitly Islamophobic representations, particularly in the right-leaning tabloids and concluded that the reaction to terrorism-related activities by the media has played into the hands of the terrorists. As you may have witnessed in the extracts sent to you from my book, I found that some sections of the British media look at Islam from an ethnocentric perspective, considering the Western culture as the only civilized culture, and any religious or cultural practice that is different is portrayed as other, and therefore not acceptable. For example, Terms like shocking, disturbing, forced, imposed, etc. were used in a Daily Mail article on gender segregation in Islam, implying that it is female oppression in the highest order. Gender segregation is a frequently covered topic in the media to castigate Islam without any effort to know its underlying reasons. Nor is there any investigation to find out whether it is actually forced or not. Most participants in my study, Muslims and non-Muslims alike, observe that the media rarely takes Muslim women's perspective while talking about gender issues in Islam. Who benefits from these negative and sensationalistic media portrayals of Muslims? The consequence is that Muslims are looked at suspiciously by a large section of the wider public, resulting in a dramatic increase of Islamophobic attacks in recent times by far-right far extremists. Baroness Warsi, former chairman of the Conservative Party, said a few years ago that Islamophobia has passed the dinner table test. And the way the media portray Islam has a big role in this attitude towards Muslims. On the other hand, Terrorists use these examples to prey on impressionable young Muslims that the West has waged a war against their faith. Are the media Islamophobic or being irresponsible? Despite the overwhelming negative portrayals of Muslims, very few academic evidences can be found that suggest that media deliberately undermine Islam and Muslims all the time. 
However, almost all research in this field agree that they are not playing a responsible role. I am currently looking at the language used in the right-wing British tabloids to investigate whether there is any Islamophobic element in the language used in these articles. My observation so far is that there are some Islamophobic elements, but irresponsible journalism far exceeds Islamophobic elements. One obvious issue I am facing in this analysis is the complexity of the term Islamophobia itself. It will be grossly unfair to put all the blames on the media. A lot of the negative stem, negative, uh, negativity stems from lack of cultural understanding, and the Muslim community have to engage more with the media to help them develop that cultural awareness. The media often get confused between religious and ethnic practices. For example, forced marriage or FGM have nothing to do with Islam, as they are cultural practices of some parts in Asia and Africa, respectively. These practices are committed by both Muslims and non-Muslims in these regions, but the media often portray them as Muslim issues. This is a matter of awareness and understanding, which can be done only through the community engaging with media practitioners. On the other hand, we, the Muslim community, also need to do some soul searching as to whether we are acting as responsible citizens of this country. Are we doing enough at family and community levels to save our young children from internet radicalization? Are we doing enough to mix with our non-Muslim neighbors? Are we actively taking part in British political process? Are we treating the women in our families fairly? Did we do enough to stop some members of our community commit those terrible crimes against young white girls in some areas? I'm not saying that we didn't do any of these. But through self-reflection, we may be able to assess whether we played our role as we should have. British Muslims are an integral part of this country, so it is important that we all work together to build this nation. The media need to seriously consider whether they should engage with the Muslim community much more than they currently do to ensure that their representations are accurate and fair. The Muslim community need to help the media in developing that understanding. And in that discussion, academics pl can play a constructive role by disseminating their research to both the media and the Muslim community to help them build the bridges. Today's conference is a humble beginning to start this conversation. It is heartening to have received good responses from all stakeholders, which is reflected in the brilliant lineup of speakers at, in this conference. However, a major drawback in the ab is the absence of those journalists and commentators who write or broadcast in mainstream media on British Muslims. When I started planning this conference, I wanted to bring people from all viewpoints, particularly those who represent Muslims negatively in the press. From this perspective, I, I admit that I have not been successful on this occasion. Many top journalists were contacted, but most of them didn't respond. Those who did respond said they were not available on this day. I, I also had time constraints from my university, as the event needed to be held within this academic year, and this may not be the best time to organize such an event. I wish to hold, possibly in partnerships with others, maybe with some people present here, more conferences in future. <coughs> this is why we have kept the final session only to discuss the way forward. I'm grateful to all the academic colleagues present today, particularly <coughs> Dr. Poole and Dr. Nagib, for agreeing to share some of their research experiences. It is great to have Chris Johnson and Talat Awan, um, Talat will be coming a bit later, uh, speaking among us, both broadcast journalists with vast experience on, of working with the community. From the Muslim community, the presence of Talha Ahmed, the treasurer of the m largest Muslim umbrella body, the MCB, Lauren Booth, an experienced journalist as well as a community activist, will be crucial in the discussions. Shinaz Banglawala has been invited to share her experience as a media analyst. While we are delighted to have among us the former NUS president, she will be coming, uh, Malia Bouatia, the first Muslim to hold this position, and someone who has been subject to intense media scrutiny in the past year. She will share her practical experience of being in the media spotlight. The structure of the conference allows everyone to be active participants rather than being passive listeners. Despite their high profile backgrounds, the guest speakers will speak for a quarter of an hour each so that we can have audience participation in both the plenary sessions. The second and third sessions are entirely dedicated to the participants with a workshop and a workshop feedback session. All participants had been sent the extracts from my book and were asked to think how this debate can be taken forward. There are five types of people attending this conference, all essential stakeholders in this debate. Apart from academics, journalists, and the Muslim community, we are delighted to have among us representatives from the Catholic, Roman Catholic and Jewish community. We, we were also expecting someone from the Sikh community, but he fell ill and he couldn't come. They all have wide experiences of working within interfaith networks, and it is important that their voices are heard with equal importance. And I think one of our speakers, Chris, is also a Roman Catholic. Uh, finally, the inclusion of some undergraduate and postgraduate students from HOPE and from some other universities ensures 
that we keep our focus firmly on the future. I look forward to hearing all the speeches and interactions throughout the day. This is just the beginning of this conversation. The two plenary sessions are being recorded and we will upload them on our dedicated YouTube channel soon after the conference. Live Twitter feed is already active and the hashtag MDABM2017, you've got that in your pack. If you are on Twitter, please take part in the discussions and upload your own photos. Let us make this conversation forward. Thank you. Before, uh, before I ask the chair to take over, um, I just wanted to let you know that you know, in your conference program, you found that we'll have um, lunch uh, at our university restaurant, hot buffet lunch. And also, uh, we'll be delighted to have you see our newly created literary rose garden, um, which uh, the English department um, you know, uh, contributed towards you know, the around 60 flowers of, uh, of different